Right, we need to look at uh, one more form of liberalism, uh, and that's multiculturalism. Now, its status as an ideology isn't necessarily clear. The term itself has been in widespread use only since the early 1990s or thereabouts. It's been described as an ideological space rather than an ideology, and that means that it's an area in which the nature of diversity and civic unity or civic commonality are discussed. But multiculturalism shares a, a number of features with liberalism, and um, it does so even though there are tensions between multiculturalism and several major ideologies. So um, I shall, I'll outline it here rather than, in a, rather than in a separate chapter. There is a substantial literature on multiculturalism and you may have men encountered that elsewhere. Uh, and I'll draw on some of that as we proceed. Of course, all societies today, it hardly needs saying, uh, are made up of different cultural inheritances in their own ways. That's hardly a new state of affairs. And the expanding body of research on languages, music, art, archaeology, and other fields shows long histories of, of uh, cultural complexity and diversity. And for example, much of the um, grammatical structure of, of the English language today is a composite of Anglo-Saxon, Norman French, and other forms of uh, French. And that's the grammatical structure. The vocabulary, of course, is uh, taken from all over the world. And we use those words and terms and phrases all the time in today's English. But the earlier forms of the language are unrecognizable uh, when we consider them through the English of our time, whether in vocabulary or in grammar. And that's been well demonstrated for a long time now. And this holds not only for languages, but for almost all areas of culture around the world. And we shall see that uh, many of the central issues in multiculturalism raise the wider question of what constitutes a culture in the first place. Well, multiculturalism as a contemporary political position seems to have started in the United States with the deepening realization among African Americans that the end of the United States Civil War might have put an end to official slavery, but that it had certainly not put an end to severe racism and racial discrimination against African Americans. In the early 20th century, several United States states, particularly the southern states, had laws enforcing racial segregation and severe racial discrimination until the federal government passed several laws against that in the early 1960s. There were campaigners. Marcus Garvey, 1887 to 1940, was born in Jamaica, and he'd earlier started a, a, a Back to Africa movement, but the strongest expressions of what was then called black consciousness came from people like Martin Luther King, Elijah Muhammad, uh, and his fellow leader Malcolm X. Martin Luther King led a non-violent civil rights movement which inherited a great deal from Gandhi's methods of peaceful, passive, non-violent resistance, but nevertheless resistance. Elijah Muhammad led the black Muslims, now called the Black Nation, for over 40 years, and his fellow leader Malcolm X was the one who said in some sort of meeting of an association that he belonged to, suddenly said, enough is enough, what do we want? freedom. When do we want it? Now. Right? Um, and the Black Panther movement and the Black Power movement got a tremendous boost from that. They took it out into the streets and spoke their minds. They were fed up with evasions and euphemisms and fed up with endless committees and procedures. They'd had enough. Well, they had a, a considerable effect. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Malcolm X was imprisoned, he always said on trumped-up charges and later died in a prison riot. Again, you'd have to check the details. But um, the, the approach has taken varied. The Black Power Movement and its associated Black Panther Party rejected violence, as did the Black Muslims. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon, I'll, I'll have to correct that. Like the Black Power Movement and the Black Panther Party in the 1960s, the black Muslims rejected nonviolence. They supported more confrontational methods, including a willingness to use arms. Uh, 
It's not an accident. It, it's worth remembering that uh, they put the issue on the agenda in the mid to late 1960s in a way that that procedural approaches, keeping within the law, keeping within the official structures, had failed to do. And uh, the riots in Watts in Los Angeles in the summer of 1965 showed that United States society would not be the same again. The, the immediate cause of those was a very confrontational police officer who had provoked confrontations wherever he'd gone just because he was a rather confrontational person. But from then, that moment on, it was clear that the United States would have to address this issue. Okay, the whole issue of racial segregation and racial discrimination. Now, it's also worth noting that like a, a lot of other movements around the world, the United States movements asserted forms of cultural or ethno-cultural identity as a means of resistance, that is, resistance to often ancient and brutal forms of systematic oppression and racial or cultural subjugation. This was the case not only in the United States, but in, in former imperial powers in the United Kingdom and in France. Assumptions of racial and cultural superiority were widely used and widely shown in the tone and forms of language and in the range and scope of, for example, media coverage. Resistance also came from movements like the language-based Quebecois, language-based Quebecois separatist movements in Canada and the Basque movements in Spain and ethno-nationalist movements such as those of Maoris in New Zealand and Aboriginal peoples in Australia. They've had an impact uh, in Canada. Well, it's very obvious. Quebecois and in the written form something closer to Parisian French is just part of the cultural fabric of the nation and documents, official documents are written in both languages and that's that. In other parts of the world, of course, the, the Basque movement have recently, relatively recently abdicated violent methods but for a time were very violent. The Welsh language has had its own impact because of, the res of resistance. The Welsh language movements from the late 60s onwards, they started as, uh, as a violent movement, the Free Wales Army, but um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the people involved were, were quickly imprisoned. But today in Wales, you, you get off a train and you find all the signs are in Welsh first and English afterwards. Welsh language is part of the fabric of life in Wales when at a time 40 or so years ago it looked as though it was dying out. Now, uh, much the same has been recognized in Australia where, where Aboriginal claims to land, although land ownership I understand is not an Aboriginal concept, Aboriginal occupation of land has been recognized in a range of ways. We need to go into the details, we don't need to do that here. But in the second half of the 20th century, other forms of multiculturalism arose uh, in the United States and in other Western countries as they imported relatively large amounts of cheap labor from other parts of the world. Now in the United States, of course, it is in effect, apart from Native Americans or First, First Americans, the United States is an immigrant nation and for a very long time now has readily received substantial numbers of people from other parts of the world. For example, very poor people from southern Europe and, for, and um, people so, um, escaping racial persecution of Jews in what was then Russia. And um, well, after the Second World War, industrial countries in Western Europe and Scandinavia imported large amounts of cheap labor from very poor regions of the world, either for post-war reconstruction or, as in the case of the United States, for agricultural work as the economy expanded very rapidly, the post-war economies expanded very rapidly. The importation in the case of the United States was from Central and Latin America. It is still a very serious issue. Well, today it's hard to believe that some of the governments concerned even thought that those they imported, who largely came from the poorest classes even in their own country of origin, would actually go back after a few years. But this has been documented in the case of the British decision in the early 1950s to import cheap labor from South Asia, from the, what was then the, uh, the British Caribbean, 
but it is documented that the cultural issues involved and that the permanence of those imported were simply not considered or were largely discounted by the states concerned. The percentages are not great, even though the media are often extremely inflammatory in their coverage. In 2011, about 10% of the then British population were of South Asian or Afro-Caribbean descent. So we're not looking at very substantial proportions at all. Of course, ask people in the street, and they'll say 20%, 40%, and so on. The usual way being swamped, frankly, nonsense. But much of that has to do with inflammatory media coverage, and virtually all the media have participated in this, either for headlines or because they've not checked the facts or because in cases they couldn't be bothered to do so, or because some of them simply were expressing the prejudices of their editors and owners. Well, in the last quarter of a century or so, there's been a further factor. Industrial countries in particular have experienced significant influxes of refugees as a result of war and ethnic conflict and other forms of upheaval, some of which have been documentedly exacerbated by foreign intervention. The obvious example for us is the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the legality of which is severely disputed. It was almost certainly illegal. It's resulted in the desperate outflow of very substantial numbers of people from the Middle East, as has the intervention in 2011 in Libya, which was intended to cause regime change. Similarly, the uh, well, the war in Syria, undoubtedly the result of an attempt to cause regime change, even though domestic assemblies such as the United Kingdom Parliament have rejected and resisted military intervention, the uh, continuing civil war in Syria, which has now lasted seven or eight years, has resulted in perhaps four to six million displaced people, millions who fled Syria. And my point here is that in recent times, perhaps the last 20 years or so, significant flows of refugees have taken place as a result of foreign intervention, whether for military or economic reasons. In South Asia, of course, we're familiar with the fact that India took about 8 million refugees from what became Bangladesh in 1971 and 72. And in the early 1990s, several countries in the Great Lakes region of Africa took a total amounting to over a million people fleeing from genocidal wars. Well, that's the, the background. Now, what about multiculturalism as policy? This dates from the mid-1960s and early 1970s. At that time, Canada and Australia officially started to call themselves multicultural societies. At about that time, public service staff in many industrial countries also started modifying policies and everyday practice. For example, in healthcare and education. And they came to see that um, earlier assumptions about uni uniformity of culture and language were actively causing harm to substantial sections of their societies or preventing the relevant groups from making the best use of public institutions and public services. This happened in the mid-1960s when, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, opinions were divided on the ethnic monitoring of claimants for social security and even the limited public health care that was available. Opinions were divided even among Afro African American movements, but the monitoring did, ethnic monitoring did start, and it showed very significant underclaiming on the part of African American communities throughout the United States. Now that led to changes in policy, in staff training, in making publicly available information about the services available, and so on. Right? And this has been done in other parts of the industrial world. Now, the point is that. Uh, these were, you know, these, these attempts to, to act on the recognition that uh, 
the societies involved were were now significantly now had significant elements or significant proportions of people from very different cultures, originally from very different cultures, did lead to uh, significantly expanded public debates on on multiculturalism. And that started in the, in the 90s and there were intense arguments for and against the very idea of multiculturalism. Multiculturalist policies are based on the recognition that particular cultural groups may have distinctive needs and um, that if we adapt policy and practice to such needs we reduce unjustifiable discrimination and we also show a recognition and even a celebration of complexity and diversity in modern societies. This kind of approach has even been extended to the design of countries' constitutions that happened in Bosnia-Herzegovina, multiculturalism. Now, of course, the issue of post-coloniality is a vast one and uh, we, we shan't cover it here. Major writers such as Franz Fanon, and Edward Said and others have written famous works on it. Uh, and among other things, they show that the, well, the impact of colonial subjecthood on colonized peoples, and they show that this impact has been immense. It permeates the consciousness of colonized, informally colonized peoples. In language, expression, manner, reactions to encounters with, with the peoples of former col colonial cultures and so on. Contemporary novelists such as Salman Rushdie have included acerbic, acidic passages on colonial and post-colonial encounters and relationships. Well, what we need to note here is that claims to the public recognition of diversity and demands for the redress of past collective harm have been strongly justified and have often resulted in substantial changes in law, policy and public institutions. But the issues raised by the idea of multiculturalism can be almost intractable or insoluble. There have been successes, for example, the 1944 uh, Education Act in England and Wales, that was no doubt a corresponding act for Scotland, uh, required that, um, that public sector educational institutions have an act of Christian worship every day. Now, when the Education Act was significantly amended in 1988, this provision was modified to recognize the very great cultural and religious diversity of the United Kingdom as it then stood. And if I'm not mistaken, the Act was rephrased to require a broadly Christian act of worship, if I'm not mistaken. But public sector educational institutions could apply for exemptions if their student composition or pupil composition would justify that. And I can recall teaching in uh, a, a public a state sector plus two college for many years. Uh, and one day, because I had a, a, a key that, that would open almost every door in the college, not many of us did, I happened to have been issued it perfectly correctly. Uh, a group of students asked me, came to my office, I think I met them at the door just by chance at lunchtime. It was a Friday and they asked if I would open a neighboring classroom which was empty uh, because they were planning to hold their Friday namaz in there. So I said, yes, of course I will. Who's your imam? And one of them was acting as the imam for that occasion. Uh, and I opened the door and let them in and of course, you know, they carried on with their, with their, with their prayer meeting. Now, nothing unusual. We were very much a public sector college. We had a very diverse intake and um, it was hardly surprising that people wanted to, to uh, observe their particular religious practice in the way it required no great issue. And I, you know, when I opened the door, I thought, yes, this is the, the 1988 Education Act at work. A lot of us in education had had issues, other issues with the 88 Act, but we certainly weren't worried about this part of it. Uh, and this kind of acceptance is now fairly widespread in the industrial world. It's often specified in constitutions or constitutional provisions which already existed have been developed uh, in the light of this. Okay.
But uh, the issues, the wider issues raised by the idea of multiculturalism can be, as I said, almost intractable or insoluble. For example, liberalism requires that we tolerate diversity, but that we cannot accept cultures or subcultures in which individual rights are violated. Now, for example, the United Kingdom accepts the jurisdiction of Jewish civil tribunals, uh, which are called, I think, Beit Din, and Islamic Sharia councils in respect of family disputes. Because in English law, that's the one I'm thinking of particularly, in English law, the parties in a civil dispute can refer the matter to an agreed third party. As long as the process is agreed and the outcome is reasonable, the decision, the decision itself, really doesn't have to be based on English law. It can be based on other systems of law, provided the process is agreed and the outcome is reasonable. Now, the Beit Din jurisdiction was approved by an Act of Parliament in the 19th century. As it happens, Sharia domestic councils in the United Kingdom seem to adjudicate more on divorce than on anything else, and 90% of the divorce cases they hear are initiated by women. That is consistent with divorce proceedings all over the world. Women initiate these to a far greater extent than men. And that is the kind of issue we'll come to later on in our topic on feminism. We're likely to encounter that one again. But problems over cultural identity arise when particular practices violate existing rights, particularly under liberal or lib liberal democratic systems of law. These could occur under other systems such as republican socialist systems, but we're looking here at conflicts between particular cultural practices and liberal or liberal democratic systems of law. For example, the British Foreign Ministry, the Foreign Commonwealth Office, has a unit dedicated to assisting British residents or citizens, British citizens, or I should say subjects of the Crown, who are victims of forced marriages. Not arranged marriages freely entered into by both partners, those are recognized in the law of the United Kingdom and have been for a long time. Another, another issue over which the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has a dedicated unit, uh, oh I beg your pardon, I'll, cor I'll, I'll correct that and I'll pause there so I can do this in editing. The Foreign Ministry in the UK, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, has a unit dedicated to assisting British residents or citizens who are victims of forced marriages. Not freely arranged marriages, but forced marriages. They, they have these offices and units in many parts of the world, and some of them have been very active in other countries in assisting not just British citizens, but British subjects who have been involved in forced marriages in their own countries, sometimes by deceit, and have therefore in one or two cases been held captive by their families when they were settled in the United Kingdom, had rights of residence and were even working there. Uh, now, in the UK, the practice of female genital mutilation is a cultural practice. It's been a criminal offence since 1985. It's also a criminal offence for British nationals or British residents to partic participate in or assist in female genital mutilation outside the United Kingdom. That's a very interesting point there. So the UK jurisdiction would extend to British residents or British citizens participating in, a, in an illegal practice in English law, I say in English law specifically, there is this corresponding law in Scotland, even if they're outside UK jurisdiction. So the criminal liability obtains even outside the UK jurisdiction if UK residents or British citizens participate in such practices. And um, British public service staff in healthcare or teaching have a legal duty now to report the offence if young people under 18 are the victims. We have to note, of course, that the current Conservative government is yet to implement a section of the Equality Act 2010, which would enable a minister to declare caste discrimination offence under the Act. That is yet to happen. It has been raised from time to time, for example, in the House of Lords, uh, in I think 2009 or thereabouts, but uh, no further action has resulted since then. 
But there are more problems over cultural identity, not just the violation by particular cultural practices of existing rights in a liberal or liberal democratic society. But there's a further problem, and that is, what does it actually mean to belong? What's involved in belonging to a particular group? And do members have significant authority to declare themselves not bound by, the, by any particular group's ways over particular issues? This in turn raises wider questions of who in a group has the authority or power to decide who does or does not belong and why. The point is that there is no avoiding questions of the substance and content of the rights claimed or the cultural practices which are at issue. An uncritical separation of faith and the state is of no help here because in practice that closes down discussion and doesn't create a space in which the relation between faith or traditional cultural practices irrespective of faith and the state can be reasoningly articulated and addressed. The point is that a very hard separation between faith and the state closes down discussion and doesn't op open up or create a space in which the relation between faith or cultural practices and the state can be articulated and discussed. The results, well, the results can be extremely troublesome and problematic. Much of the current debate in European countries about possible bans on the hijab have excluded, for example, European women who happen to be Muslims from any serious exploration and explora exploration and expression of what equality, citizenship and faith might mean to them. That can hardly be what we mean if we're liberals and we advocate cultural rights. In effect, as has been pointed out in France, French citizens who happen to be Muslim women seem to have gone unnoticed in the argument about, about the hijab, about wearing the veil in public or in public services or in public institutions and so on. That's been documented. My source here is someone called Kennedy who wrote a, a paper on this. Now, other major ideologies have also had their problems over multiculturalism, <coughs> excuse me, conservatism, unsurprisingly, is one of the ideologies most incompatible with it. Because according to conservatism, shared values and shared practices and traditions are part of a shared history. And they form a national identity. For most conservative thinkers, nationalism overrides or takes priority over multiculturalism. Precisely because of the extent to which shared cultural assumptions, a shared cultural history, shared practices are part and parcel of a conservative outlook on life and a conservative outlook on what makes a culture, a practice, a nation and so on. Now, it is further the case that any account of multi multiculturalism faces a problem over inequalities of power and status, that is, structural inequalities. Uh, a great deal of work on multiculturalism rather neglects this. Yes, it is the case that advocates of multiculturalism have often sought recognition, advancement or redress through the assertion of cultural or ethnic identity. But that in turn opens the possibility that Practices such as child marriage could at least in theory be justified as being central to any given culture. And that shows another significant area that multiculturalism seems to have neglected and that's the question of what constitutes a culture in the first place. Any serious examination of that will of course very quickly show us the complexity and variety of almost any culture on the planet and the mutability of any and all cultures. It's a very uncomfortable space to be in, but it is the space we're in anyway. And that emerges when we examine multiculturalism closely. Well, for example, Nasar Mir and Tariq Modud have pointed out that 
what they call interculturalism has to be a political discourse if it is to enable us to express and address the wide range of concerns which inevitably arise because our identities are complex as are the areas in respect of which we you know we significantly um, and you know are equally and significantly different yes we are equally and significantly different in in an enormous number of ways but the fact is that our identities are equally complex uncertain often mutable think of the arguments around gender self-assignation or sexual or self or the self-description of sexual orientation today yes these are current issues rightly so and are getting attention which they of course should have but think of the ways in which we no longer readily accept assigned identities over things like sexual orientation or gender self gender identification and so on now in effect what multiculturalism shows us if we take it seriously is that all cultures are continuing conversations that is a a point i take from Hiko Parekh who wrote about this in the late 1990s that means that all cultures are involved in so to speak exchanges with their own inheritances and those of other cultures however different those others might seem to be and we find archaeological and other evidence of cultural influences all over the world dating back even thousands of years nothing unusual humans have always exchanged languages ideas currency trade knowledge and so on we don't need to spend too much time on this here but the work of Aristotle was rescued by a Roman general if I'm not mistaken called Sulla when Sulla's soldiers might have burnt the books uh, Sulla recognized he was quite a scholar himself that he was reading the work of a great philosopher and took it back to Rome with him but something like a thousand years later uh, perhaps just under a thousand years later in Moorish Spain at least one scholar I think it was Ibn, Ibn Rashid recognized that the work of Aristotle was that of a great philosopher translated it into Latin because very few people at that time had classical Greek and returned made the work therefore available in Europe where the literate people had Latin a similar project was undertaken by a Persian philosopher I think it was um, Ibn Sina I'm, I'm, I can't remember which was Persian which was which was Moorish uh, but they both in effect returned the work to its to its cultural home but they recognized the great philosopher where they saw one and this is there's nothing unusual about this works have been it's not just works but cultures food habits trade in food trade in textiles has continued as, as far as we know as long as humans have existed and therefore the very idea of cultures as walled off as self-enclosed cells of some kind is ultimately incoherent and untenable but what does that require of us it does mean that we have to engage with the substance of cultures we encounter and for liberal political philosophy for liberal ideology that does mean having to find a response to cultures and practices where the fundamental precepts of liberalism are violated this is not straightforward uh, and in practice liberal democracies have usually made it clear that existing rights must not be infringed by cultural practices of any kind it doesn't matter whose culture they are they must not be infringed this issue has arisen uh, as a result I'll just give you an example of a lecture given to uh, senior lawyers barristers courtroom lawyers in England by the then Archbishop of Canterbury Rowan Williams now Dr. Williams pointed out that uh, if I'm not mistaken he pointed out that uh, the Jewish domestic tribunal the family tribunal has long had uh, 
legal recognition in, in the United Kingdom. And um, Dr. Williams expected that um, Sharia law or aspects of Sharia law would be formally recognized before too long. Now, inevitably, the press, I would say, badly misreported Dr. Williams and grossly exaggerated the likely consequences of what he'd said. What the press coverage seemed not to say at the time was that Sharia law was already a, a perfectly good and valid procedure for the settlement of certain kinds of family disputes and had already been in use for quite a long time. It was perfectly consistent in these uses with existing English law, right? And by implication, Scots law as well, by implication. But the point is that existing rights in English law or Scots law were not to be not to be violated. Now that is one kind of liberal response. Liberalism can accommodate, it has to accommodate plurality and diversity, but it can't accept the violation of fundamental liberal principles. We shall see an example of that as we proceed.